Welcome to you, those of you who, uh, this is the, your first exposure to UK Pony, the UK project on nuclear issues. Welcome, those of you, I see many repeat faces, so great to see you back again. Um, UK Pony is focused on developing and sort of, I suppose, curating and linking uh, the community of emerging nuclear scholars and professionals in the UK. So uh, it's really great to see so many of you here trying to get an introduction to nuclear weapons policy. This workshop is one of two that we decided to set up and run. The first is already run, which is on nuclear weapons technology. We aimed that one at uh, people who are sort of from a more policy background, might be academics studying international uh, relations or what have you, uh, who want to get an introduction to the technologies. This is the converse. So a lot of you I've seen from the attendee list have either a technical background or you're working in governments on various other programs, things like that. Uh, and so this is a pretty basic introduction to some of the key issues that you might see in nuclear weapons policy. So today I'm going to be talking to you about deterrence first. You've got all of your, your programs on the chair. Then shortly after that, uh, Jamie Kwong, who's the first UK Pony Intern Research Assistant for the program, is going to come and talk to you about global nuclear programs. Uh, and then we're going to, we're very grateful to the MOD after lunch, who are going to uh, have a couple of speakers come and talk to you about the UK, UK nuclear policy, so give a government perspective. Then we'll do disarmament and non-proliferation with our own Christina Variali, who focuses on that here, uh, before bringing in one of our partners from Vertic, who's going to talk about nuclear safety, security and safeguards. So that's it's going to be a pretty uh, intense canter through all the issues. And I wouldn't say by the end of it you'll be experts, but hopefully at least at this point you'll then know, you know, when people start talking about NPT, CTPT, uh, so was it conference on the Middle East zone free of weapons of mass destruction, all that sort of stuff. It won't be the first time you've heard of it. You may even know something about it. And, you know, top marks to those of you who go away afterwards and do a bit of research about those things. Anyway, without further ado, uh, introduction to deterrence. Oh, there we go. See, I'll just run through that. There we go. This is me. Good. Okay, so um, who knows what deterrence is? Any ideas? Always good to start the day throwing it at the group. It's, oh, no, you're supposed to be talking to me. OK, uh, there's a couple of different ideas about what um, deterrence, how deterrence can be framed. Um, most often, you think about two ideas, the idea of deterrence by denial or deterrence by punishment. The concept of deterrence is effectively about getting somebody or something or some entity to not do something that they might do. There's various other different framings of that. You could also talk about getting them to stop doing something that they're already doing or get them to do something that they don't want to do. Those have different names, compellence, coercion, things like that. Deterrence is more about getting people to stop things that, they're not, that, that they might do, that you worry they might do, uh, and you don't want them to. But that's sort of what you're doing. It's not what it is. I mean, deterrence is a, a psychological phenomenon. It's something that happens, behavioral psychology. It's something that sort of happens in the brain. So I would argue if you really want to start learning about the basics of deterrence of psychology. You need to start thinking about behavioural economics, behavioural psychology and all that sort of stuff. That's where this comes from. And so one of my colleagues, uh, Mike Codner, who's written a lot about deterrence, the sort of the thematic basis of it, adapts a typology from another source. And he describes it as a, the application of the military instrument to the cognitive domain. He defines suasion, the process of changing people's minds in some way, persuasion, etc. Uh, as the application of the military instrument to the cognitive domain. Deterrence being a subcategory of that spectrum. So that's the idea that we have in mind here. What I'm going to talk about today is really a historical view. I'm just going to walk you through how concepts evolved, how they were linked to technologies, because you can never really divorce them from each other, right? You know, you may want to practice this application of the military instrument to the cognitive domain in a particular way, but if your technologies constrain you, or force you to behave in a different way, then that's what it's going to be. You know, you have limited discretion. Uh, so we'll go through the history of it. Um, we will play a few games throughout, actually, if I can get them to work. So, you know, stand by. There will be interaction with each other. Not too much with me, but with each other, certainly. Um, and you should, by the way, throw out questions throughout. I just stick hands up, things like that. I would much prefer you do that than, than save them to the end because there's every chance, if you have a question, that somebody else has the exact same question as well and that I've just said something you know, which is not understandable. So please just stick your hand up if you have something. I'll keep a, keep a lookout for you. And then at the end, I think because it's relevant, a couple of concepts around something called extended deterrence, which you'll hear a bit about. Uh, and then nuclear deterrence and international law, which will lead nicely into some of the stuff later on about uh, disarmament, I think. All right, so first thing, nuclear deterrence. So one of the first authors who wrote really about 
nuclear deterrence, or the advent of the bomb was this guy, Bernard Brody, um, who basically argued that nuclear deterrence was a special case. There were special features of deterrence that made it different, of nuclear deterrence, that is, that made it different to this other idea of you know, military application of the military instrument to the cognitive domain. There are things which, are, which nuclear weapons have about them, about the technology, that are just a, a level beyond conventional weaponry. And one, of course, is the sheer scale of the force you can threaten. You know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, of course, being the examples of that. You could also argue that immediacy is an issue. I mean, think of the, fire, think of the bombings of Dresden, the Blitz, think of the Allied bombing raids in Europe and so forth, and the amount of people that died during that, and compare that to the number of people that died during Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, both terrible things, both terrible things to happen to civilians. The numbers are different, but then in, in some sense, the immediacy the, uh, of the actions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki in a way changed the psychology of them. So this is a thing that I think is relevant. And again, if you wanted to go back to behavioral psychology, you would see that process. There's, some, there's something called effect, affect. Emotional response affects your judgment of probability. And therefore, because this has a strong emotional response, it will have a different effect to decision makers. Anyway, it's something for you to dig into in your own time. Um, of course, you have this idea of destruction of a distance. So you don't need to have the best army in the world to be able to wipe a city off the face of the earth. And that's a change in warfare at that point in the 1940s. He hypothesizes, although at the time that he was writing there was only one nuclear power, that other nuclear powers may emerge, and therefore that leads to the potential for this attack-defense imbalance, offensive-defensive balance here, to, uh, to be extended in more than one direction. It will not always be the US or the possession of the weapon. It will be others. And of course, he was right in that regard. Um, and what that means, of course, is that if you can't defend against these things, but you have to, you can only threaten incredible immediate force, largely in this case against civilian populations, or well, not, not always, you have this sense that these are now political weapons in a way. They are already at this point being thought of in psychological terms. They can be used to deter and compel. So right, right at the beginning of the atomic age, thinkers are going, well, hang on, these weapons might have more power and they might be more scary and threatening than conventional weapons. Um, but they might also be, and they might be different in some kind of special characteristic, but they might also be limited as well in terms of how you might feel it legitimate to use them. So that's kind of an interesting concept, I think. So where does this go? So again, in an example of how technologies frame politics, obviously early nuclear thinking, you've kind of got this idea that, you know, for the majority of this sort of first 10 years, you have a, a nuclear monad and then goes to a nuclear diode with the Soviet Union and so forth. So the US sort of flexes its nuclear muscles a little bit. It threatens China, um, both directly and indirectly over Taiwan and Korea, the Korean War, 1950-53, and the first Taiwan Straits crisis. Um, but then there was this idea, of, could, could you seriously threaten with the capabilities at the time as the, as the US, the Soviet Union? And it's not that, it's not that these weapons uh, exist in the Soviet Union. You might have this you know, deterrence dynamic that we'll talk about later. It's simply because the planes are not going to get through. That's it. There's just not that many weapons. The mission is not going to make it through. So there's this sense of, can you seriously threaten the, the Soviet Union in that regard? The, the thing which would have changed that would be improved US nuclear bomber capabilities. But unfortunately for the US, or maybe fortunately for everyone, I don't know, um, Soviet nuclear developments arrived at about the same time. So the counterfactual that we could have explored, where there was this threat ability to threaten the Soviet Union, never in fact emerged. And you had a dyad before that could happen. So you have this idea that as the threat from the Soviet Union develops, or as the perceived threat, I should say, because I'm not taking a side here. I'm just sort of saying how these two uh, interacted. There's this idea emerging. Um, and this is really the classic expression of it from John Foster Dulles in 1954. Worth going away and Googling the quote and reading the rest of the speech, by the way. Um, this idea that response to future aggression, which doesn't just mean if you nuke us, we're going to nuke you. It means conventional aggression against US interests will be met by, quotes, massive retaliation by means and places, uh, means and at places of our choosing. You know, declining to say this doesn't mean nukes. I mean, it means nukes. It means we can do anything. So this is idea that, you know, any step over the line, wherever we draw the line, will be met by a total response, massive response which can only mean uh, nukes as well. So you sort of have this sense of um, that's a hell of a threat 
it's barely credible in today's world, isn't it? It seems. Um, but then, you know, that's what was being pushed forward. Then you have this idea, though, uh, if you just have nuclear weapons and you say things like that, does that influence people? Is it because of that credibility issue? How, how does that influence sort of dynamic work? So people were kind of, this is where you get this sort of emerging school of academic thought around uh, deterrence, how it might emerge. And, um, you know, it comes out of the economists and the game theorists. They didn't know behavioral economics at this point, which I think is the bit that was missing. But you have the ec economists and the game theorists. It becomes very, very mathematical. You know, you get Institute, you get RAND and stuff like that. You get um, uh, Princeton even, you know, the Institute for Studies at Princeton getting involved. John von Neumann, another, you know, famed as the, found, you know, one of the founding fathers of supercomputing, um, you know, basically gets the funding to work on supercomputing because uh, he's doing side projects, because he, he's, sorry, he's doing his projects as side projects on work for the nuclear complex in the US. So there's this kind of weird interaction going on here um, in, the, in, the, um, in the culture and the bureaucracy and all the people around it, which again, I suppose, is worth a, worth a look. So you have this idea that this kind of quite technocratic group is developing concepts uh, which are pretty sort of mathematical and economic about how deterrence could operate. And you have these ideas, these terms that come up. Who's heard of counterforce and countervalue? Who's heard those words? Some. They're pretty, right, more hands going up as they get more confident. That's what I like to see. Um, you know, they're kind of counterforce, countervalue is a hell of a euphemism. It means wiping cities and factories out. I mean, that's what it means. Let's not be coy about this. Counterforce is a different matter. It can mean a number of things. It can mean going after command and control. It can mean going after platforms, missiles, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but you'll have seen, if you've read around any of this stuff, and if you continue to after this workshop, the nuclear world is full of euphemisms. So decoding this is, is kind of an interesting one. I think we should <laughs> try and be honest about what we mean. Um, anyway, so there we go. We've got this idea that both sides in this diet, the US and the Soviet Union, have these arsenals of strategic bombers, which take absolutely ages to get ready, or some of the missiles as well, liquid fuel ballistic missiles, take ages to get ready to launch. The, the observation time, the plausible observation and response time, is you know, pretty long. And so you have this idea that, um, you have this idea that maybe they can be hit while they're not ready. They can be hit while they're in the silo, not in the silo, sorry, they can be hit while they're in the hangars, or the, maybe even the airfields can be hit so that the planes can't even take off in the first place, and so on and so on. So disarming strikes at this point might be feasible. You know, the technologist going, hang on, this is a thing that might be possible, and if you don't do it, by the way, the other guy probably will. And by the way, it was a guy back then. Um, so anyway, we have this um, possibility that something quite worrying might be emerging. So let's think to the John Foster Dulles speech when he says, you know, the response to any aggression, any aggression will be massive retaliation through means and times at places of our choosing. So it could be not where you originally attacked, it could be somewhere else, it could involve other means, etc. So let's think, if you're expecting, you know, if you are planning aggression against someone, then you should logically expect that the other side will follow through on that threat, or at least that they might. So that's an interesting one. And then you've got this idea that you have um, the potential for counterforce. You don't know, but you think it might be possible that the other side could remove all of your capabilities. So if you are considering any aggression at all, you must think, one, I'm at severe risk of nuclear attack, two, that my nuclear weapons could be destroyed in that attack, and therefore, if I'm considering any aggression, or if, I'm consider if I think it's possible that someone might think that I'm considering aggression, I should go hard early. I should go with all of my weapons early because the other side won't hesitate, or I can't guarantee that they won't. And so we have this really hideous kind of cycle of thinking through what the other side thinks that you might do, that what they might do, and so on. And even to this last point of sort of, if you suspect you might be being seen as crossing a red, never mind whether you're planning aggression or not, whether you might be being seen as crossing that red line is another thing that you would think about. Can you guarantee that the decision makers in the other capital are getting the right view of what you're doing, you know, et cetera. So what does this mean for nuclear deterrence? Well, let's find out. Uh, so this is going to involve a little bit of game playing. So it's an adaptation of one that I do on a summer course in a three hour long lecture, so it's a little bit different. Uh, this is, um, I haven't given it a name because it's a little bit like rock, paper, scissors, but you're gonna play it in pairs. So look to a person sitting next to you. I hope there are, 
even numbers. You're by yourself, so you're going to be a, a, a test dummy, if you don't mind. Would you mind coming up yeah, sure. and performing? Thank you. A round of applause for the, uh, <laughs> for the victim. Thank you very much. So, right, good. Thank you very much for this. Yeah. I, I guarantee I won't put you on the table and saw you in half or anything like that. Oh, okay. Okay, so the idea here is we're going to play a game of nuclear deterrence in this world. And what we're going to do is we're going to hold our hands like this and sort of in rock, paper, scissors, star go mm -hmm. one, two, three. And then on the three, one, two, three. We're either going to stick out our hand to shake hands mm -hmm. or we're going to stick out a gun to shoot each other. Okay. OK, right, so this is the dynamic that we have. By the way, to simulate this environment, if you get a gun pointed at you in the game, that's it. That's you, you're out. The game's over. OK, yeah. let's go for it. Ready? So reveal on three. One, two, three. Right, I've been shot. That's it. <laughs> game over. So he's obviously got the hang of it. Try again. So we don't get to play again. That's it. So thank you very much for that. I think you've got the hang of it. Cheers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Now what I'd like you to do is attempt to play that in pairs and go for as long as you can. All right? Those of you who shot someone, can you just pair up with somebody else? Just do that just now, if you wouldn't mind. Pair up with somebody else who you didn't play with before. So those of you who've been shot, you're out. Sorry about that. Yeah. So those of you, those of you who have, those of you who did the shooting, please pair up with somebody else who also did some shooting and is therefore, is therefore unengaged and play the game again. <laughs> we have some very peaceful people here, but we also have some pretty bloodthirsty ones. Um, who, who did some shooting, by the way? Stick your hands up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, fine. Um, about over that short game. About uh, one in three, maybe two in five people used their weapons in a situation uh, where, you know, I had explicitly said, try and go for as long as you can. That's quite an interesting one. If you had uh, then, if you're one of the people who already did some shooting, who got to play a game twice? Yeah, okay. What happened in the second game? Did you use weapons again then? I got shot straight away. You got shot straight away? I went and made peace. Right. <laughs> Hold that thought. Hold that thought. Somebody who, who used their weapons once went to somebody else who knew that they had used their weapons and then immediately went for them. Of course. Of course. Because you can't guarantee. You've, your only evidence that they, they might or might not exercise restraint is the one thing that you've seen them do. And so this is the dynamic that might lead to, if it was a word that wasn't dynamic, that this idea might lead to that chain reaction that, you know, if, you, if anybody's read On the Beach, by the way, Neville Shoot, you should, everybody who's working in the nuclear world should read that book, by the way. That's an absolutely seminal one. But it's not an academic one. It's a great read. If you can get through it without questioning your life choices, then uh, I salute you. I found it a, a, a really interesting one. There's actually a good game theoretical result which supports this, by the way. So the idea is, who's heard of The Prisoner's Dilemma? A few people, right? You know that the canonical solution in The Prisoner's Dilemma, if you've heard of it, is to defect. Everybody knows that. But the canonical solution in the prisoner's dilemma when it's repeated is to cooperate because your expected outcome, or rather it's, it's a little more complicated, but if, you, if, it, terminates, if it terminates after uh, lack of cooperation, then you're quite right because your expected outcome is much greater. Right, so there's this idea that you have the reciprocal fear of surprise attack, right? Uh, and the consequence is this delicate balance of terror. War games, are, I'm going to put sort of pepper this with cultural artifacts, frankly, because, you know, nobody wants to read textbooks, but watching war games is actually fine, and reading on the beach is okay. So these things will hopefully tell you about, a little bit about deterrence. I think they tell you about deterrence anyway. So the idea is that there is a significant chance of defection in a crisis. It is not, as you said, in this circumstance, this game, it is not likely, but I would argue that a one in three or a two in five chance of defection in a crisis is pretty high when you're considering annihilation. Uh, and imagine, though, that I didn't give you a crisis. I, I could have given you a crisis thing which would have made that probability high, right? So you have this idea that you're really trying to avoid crisis. The only willing move is not to play, which is what the supercomputer at the end of war games says. Um, chess, you know, that sort of thing. But what if you're expecting to be attacked? What if, as we found with the people who played the game twice, those who had done some shooting, as it were, um, are going to another person who must have an elevated fear of attack? So you think the probability is low, but the consequence is so high you can't ignore it, et cetera, et cetera. You have this idea it's not just about choosing to go to war in a sort of Clausewitzian extended campaign. I'm going to sort of roll my forces forward. It will be quite slow and drawn out, et cetera. It's, a, it's existential. It's immediately existential. And you get this, um, this strong reinforcing incentive for preemption. And so you have this idea, well, how can I fix that? And that motivates development of something called secure second strike. Right. So it's gone from that. 
And so that's formulated quite early on in the atomic age as well, actually, 1959. Um, so Wolsetter lays it out, the framework of a set of requirements for secure second strike. This idea that if there was an attempt to destroy you and your weapons to start with, there would always be an ability to strike back. You would never be entirely disarmed as you were in the game that we've just played. Um, so the requirements would be, one, it's safe and affordable, of course. Um, two, able to survive attacks, including nuclear attacks, because, of course, then it's not you know, if it's decapitating, then it's just the, back to the same situation that you were in before. You, you've made no progress whatsoever. You should be able to make and communicate decisions to retaliate. Now, that's quite important because this idea of communication is quite fundamental to deterrence. It's fundamental to psychology, the way we interact with each other. So how can it be anything other than fundamental to deterrence? Um, and so Walset is sort of laying out this idea that it's not just about the weapons that you have, but it's also about the ways that you are going to use them to signal and how operationally that will happen. How in a crisis are you going to pick up the phone to the adversary when the phone lines are all down? How's that going to work? Etc. All that sort of stuff. So there's an element of thinking about that kind of crisis communication as part of a deterrent structure. And then, of course, you need to be able to retaliate in the face of these defences. And a conventional, you know, a contemporary example of that issue is, of course, missile defence. Uh, which we're going to talk a little bit about later on. You know, if your forces are degraded and there is missile defence on the adversary side, you know, how confident are you that you're second strike, etc., etc. So the framing of it is you must be able to with, with, uh, withstand a counterforce first strike. Someone is going to attack your nuclear weapons. You're going to make sure that there are some left to use. And number two, you may not be able to disarm them in your second strike, but you are going to kill a lot of people. You are going to deliver a counter-value second strike. Um, that's the minimum requirement that Wallsetter lays out for secure second strike. It could be exceeded, right? You could imagine even having a counter-value second strike. Why not? It would still be secure second strike, but this is the minimum requirement that he lays out. And in practice, so how, how can you actually do this? And here we come back to technical reality limiting what's feasible, limiting what's possible. So one, you could do, and this was mooted at the time, right? You could just buy and develop and put out in the field an absolute ton of nuclear weapons, you know, strategic bombers, et cetera, et cetera, uh, silo-based systems, whatever, and you could just get the idea that no matter how many nuclear weapons the adversary throws at us, we will always have some left over because we just have so many. That's option one. Option two would be high alert, right? So you have a smaller number of systems, but the ones that you have are ready to go at a moment's notice or they're already in the air, flying around, ready to be used. Um, and you have these great C2 command and control systems ready to communicate that decision. Or option three, you disperse and harden. So you've got lots of systems, good command and control, lots of security, all spread out, um, all, in, all made less vulnerable in a number of different ways. Now, option three sounds better for various reasons. But unfortunately, the technologies at the time that we're thinking about didn't really permit it. So instead, we have option two. Option one was ruled out. I think, thankfully, pretty early on. Um, it's just massively incentivizing an adversary to just, yeah, it's very bad. Um, you get this real arms race thing going on. So you have this idea of um, high alert, launch on warning and airborne alert. That top diagram, by the way, those, this is the example of, um, I think Chrome Dome actually was the name of the operation. There are a number of different ones, but if you were to go away and Google Chrome Dome, you would find an interesting wiki click hole uh, to follow. Lots of interesting stuff going on there. Um, because the technology doesn't necessarily permit the dispersed, hardened nuclear triad that we'll talk a little bit about later on at this time, you instead have airborne alert. You're flying aeroplanes around with armed nuclear weapons all the time uh, on routes up and around sort of the airspace, around the Soviet Union in this case, but of course the Soviet Union was doing it too, um, on routes and they sort of go up to an outer marker, turn around and come back. But who's to say that they couldn't just keep going? So that has the effect of reducing the time to target for those systems if you need to in a crisis. It's bringing everybody a little bit closer to the edge. Um, on the other hand, the logic goes, because the adversary knows that you're doing that, they're less likely to bring you close to that edge in the first place. OK. Um, that mm, worked in a number of cases and less in others. I mean, there was no nuclear use during the Cold War, but as you know, we came pretty close in some cases. Anyway, so this is the idea. But that is massively uh, problematic in a number of ways. One is that, uh, I mean, 
there's a great book called Command and Control, Eric Schlosser, which principally focuses on, you know, focuses on nuclear weapons accidents. But some of the most horrific ones are to do with the operation of the airborne alert system. And basically what you're doing is you've got these quite you know, primitive, by today's standards, nuclear weapons, I guess, uh, taking off and landing a lot. And as any pilot would tell you, the takeoff and landing is the worst bit of the flight. And you're just giving more opportunities for that system to have a problem which is not something that you want to happen with nuclear weapons. And there are a number of circumstances where you can see, you know, plane crashes, uh, weapons coming off pylons, uh, dis you know, weapon dropped off Greenland by accident, all that sort of stuff, uh, which is just not something you want to do. So you, you've, you've got this risk profile, and effectively what you're doing is you're increasing your exposure to it. You're, um, you're kind of expanding... Uh, the number of, uh, you're kind of expanding the number of um, opportunities you have for your system to have a problem and for that problem to be uh, consequential. So, happily, technology, well, happily, uh, we move away from that. Technology advances and we end up with, um, you know, starts to permit things like long range SSBN patrols, you know, starts to uh, permit better command and control for ICBMs, for aircraft and so on. And if you ha the idea goes, for example, not so much that every element of your triad has to deliver all possible characteristics of a secure second strike, but between them, the triad will deliver those things. Um, this is the idea that sort of leads to this, this plan. So each of, these <coughs> each of these systems contributes an element to it. One, of course, the long-range bombers. So you have this idea that, um, well, unlike, say, ICBMs, silo-based ICBMs and SLBMs, you can see them. That's quite good for signaling. So if you want to pick up the phone to your adversary and say, look, I'm, I'm a little bit annoyed about what you're doing. In fact, I'm so annoyed that I've escalated the alert level of my forces. But trust me, they're submarines, they're there. But I'm not going to tell you where they are because, A, I don't want you to find them and, you know, all that sort of stuff. It's not that effective. But if you were to say, well, but you can look at, you know, Edwards Air Force Base or whatever and you can see that there are more planes on the tarmac now or maybe I've staged them to Europe or whatever, you know, that's the idea, that they're quite visible. Also, you know, if they take off, they can come back, in theory. Um, that is the plan. Um, ICBMs. Uh, have the great advantage of being, you know, yes, they're fixed in place. Every, everything's expensive, but as the systems go, less expensive. Um, potentially, they can be launched extremely rapidly. You know, they're in place, a couple of key turns, off you go, crude all the time, 24 hours a day. Um, but you do have this, in the economic, technocratic uh, world of nuclear war planning at this time, they are a warhead sink. It will take the adversary a number of warheads to reliably destroy a silo, and those warheads could be going somewhere else. So basically, they're there to get nuked. That's one of the things that they're for. Uh, and actually, contemporary Russian literature, very interesting, in Russian language literature, who I would argue, actually, that the Russians, I think, are doing a little more thinking about the theory of this now than maybe we are um, in some of the Russian language writings. They talk a little bit about this idea uh, now, even now, which I think is quite interesting. Um, so anyway, and then you have SLBM, submarine launched ballistic missiles on <coughs> ballistic missile submarines. The idea behind those is, yes, they're slow. Uh, yes, they are fantastically expensive to operate. Yes, you know, single platform, vulnerable if you can find it, but good luck finding it. That is the, that's the general idea. Um, and of course, those of you who are familiar with the UK deterrent will know that that's essentially the way that we've gone, entirely that way. And the, the plan is, you know, it might not be as immediate as an ICBM, but it's coming. And you can't stop it coming because you can't find it. So you could never guarantee, adversary, that even if you were to obliterate my command and control uh, capabilities, that there would not be some instruction given to the commander of the submarine if they had not received communication for a period of time to act in a particular way that would be detrimental to your interests, and so on. That's the idea. So this is how it goes. You sort of technological reality constrains this political development. We go through this period of quite enhanced risk. So. There's this idea of mutual assured destruction, which I'm sure you've all heard of. It leads to many puns because of the acronym. And uh, incidentally, it's only that because of John von Neumann, the guy I mentioned earlier, thought it would be funny. It was originally framed as a mutual assured vulnerability. And he thought it would be better if it was mutual assured destruction because then he could write lots of documents that said, this is mad, M-A-D, right? True story. Um, so the idea, the original framing was mutual assured vulnerability. Uh, not mutual assured destruction. And actually, mutual assured vulnerability is more accurate in terms of what was being put forward. Uh, 
It wasn't to say at this time that any nuclear exchange would be civilization ending for both parties. It was to say that both would be vulnerable in some way. It wasn't to say equally vulnerable, it would just say vulnerable. Uh, and it may have evolved in that direction, but that wasn't the original conception. So this is a great example, by the way, and we're going to see another one later with extended deterrence of how terms evolve in meaning over time, or how ideas evolve in meaning over time. So the original framing was that. Um, but we'll stick with MAD because, you know, puns. Um, technological challenges to that. Um, so there's this idea of, um, you know, I said that ICBMs can be a warhead sink. Well, that is true, and uh, you could expect to use a lot of them. But if you can MERV your systems, if you can put, and most of you as technologists will know what this is, if you can put multiple independently targeted reentry vehicles on a platform, on a missile, then any one missile is now, you know, if you were to leave 1% of a missile field standing, that, that is going to be vastly more warheads than you originally left at play. So it really kind of eliminates some of, the, well, not so much eliminates, it incentivizes removal of the entire thing. Uh, so there are, some, there are some kind of challenges to that. And um, again, authors on both sides of the Atlantic have written about MERVing as a destabilizing thing. In fact, that's one of the reasons why the US voluntarily, um, well, not voluntarily, but chooses not to upload maximum capacity to its, some of its contemporary ICBMs. Um, of course, Russians worry that they will anyway. Anyway, but a separate, separate conversation. And then the second one, which is strategic defense, missile defense that I talked about earlier. This idea that by accepting mutual assured vulnerability, you have to encourage, allow the other side to threaten you for your security benefit, because you don't want to be in a nuclear war of any kind. Therefore, you have to assure them that their weapons are threatening you and show that. Isn't that interesting? So by the way, this encouragement actually happened. The US encouraged the Soviet Union to develop this, and there were conversations about what ideas even could be shared to allow that to happen to the greater benefit of both security. I find that a very interesting thing. I'm not a historian of it, so I'm going to leave that there. Um, but I think um, that's a very interesting phenomenon to think about cooperation at a time of distrust. You know, realism sort of triumphs in a way. Anyway. Um, Strategic defense, though, on the other issue, imagine unrestrained anti-ballistic missile technology. This idea that now, OK, you've got mutual assured vulnerability, uh, but each side could develop a, a capability to threaten that, to make itself more secure. And so we go back to wall setter in a way. You know, what's the requirement for that secure second strike? It is to be able to survive a counterforce first strike and deliver a counter value second strike. So what that means is defending your nuclear forces is OK, Defending your cities is not. That's nuts, isn't it? It's, if you think about the abstract, I mean, if you work through the technocratic, it's totally logical. It makes a ton of sense. Um, and if you were to play the games out, you know, all the game theorists would tell you, yes, that's how it works. However, defending population centers is considered and is quite accurately in this framing destabilizing, uh, which I find a truly mad consequence. So there we go. And the US-Soviet ABM Treaty basically says that. You can have two ABM sites. You can defend a missile field, and you can defend your command and control center, which happens to be a capital. So yeah, you get to defend one population center. But you better not try and defend Los Angeles. You better not try and defend St. Petersburg, etc. So this is the idea, right? Um, those two things are technological challenges to mutual assured vulnerability or destruction. And to some extent, those of you who are looking at, who are interested in the crisis of arms control in Europe at present, um, a lot of it is about these technological challenges to mutual vulnerability. Yes, there's prestige. Yes, there's other things going on. Status, reassertion of et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there is a lot going on uh, to do with serious concerns, at least, about, about the survivability uh, of secure second strike, at least on the Russian side. Whether or not those concerns are valid and whether they've behaved appropriately is another question entirely. But you know, I would, I would argue that at least some of it stems from that. Anyway, all right. So let's play the game again. But this time, you've got secure second strike. So we're going to play the same thing. But if you shake your hand with the other person and they point their fingers at you to shoot you, you can change your answer. Your second strike, right? So you're shaking hands. You can then go, actually, you've shot me. I don't like that. You can do this. All right? That's the only rule change. Everything else is the same. So I'd like you to give it a go. Um, and we're going to see who's left standing at the end. Please, off you go. So some people did defect, but vastly fewer, vastly fewer. And those of you who didn't, 
acted in a sort of, in some ways consistent with the game, certain ways consistent with, they made a number of off-board moves, I suppose you could say. They took a number of actions to increase the likelihood of cooperation uh, of various different kinds. Um, some of it might have been, you know, isn't this a strange game, the only willing move is not to play. Uh, wouldn't we prefer to have a nice game of chess instead? Uh, you know, why would anybody... Sh All of those things are saying, we have a shared interest or we have a, a shared conception of the common good which involves not shooting each other. So let's just do that. Um, and then it's backed up by the ability, you know, by the way, if things, if things do degrade, we don't have to say it, but each of us knows that either one of us could, could, follow, up in a, could follow up with a retaliation. So let's ask this question then. We've had a couple of ones where you did, to, to some extent, feel the mutual, you know, the fear of surprise attack, this reciprocal fear of surprise attack when you had only first strike. Then you've had this other one, which has been a much more kind of communicative one, partly because of your experience uh, of the first game, to be fair. But I would say, you know, I'd ask you the question. So we've just been discussing all these different deterrent considerations. I've outlined some. To what extent do you think your experiences have been representative? Where do you see parallels between what I've described and what you have not so much done, but felt while doing it? Because again, this is the psychology point. So basically what Therese Delpes is saying, you know, yes, there's some value of game theory. So in the sense that you can formulate it in a move, counter move setting. I mean, I might even argue with that, but you know, but then there's this sense to, to your point where you're saying about there's no rules. She says, well, why do the rules have to be formalized? And in what way is this connected to real decision making? To your point at the back, you know, what is you always have discretion in this game, but you don't always have discretion in reality. Um, and then you think about different strategies and how these kind of things work. That last sentence is an absolute crusher. We must learn more about regional issues and know specifically who the opponents are in order to make meaningful policy rather than turn them into abstract players in some heuristic game of questionable relevance to the real world. Ouch. Uh, that is a, a, bit of a, a bit of a savage indictment. I still like games, but I think you have to think about uh, what real world conclusions you can draw. And I think maybe the problematic element that Del Pesce is picking up on here with early Cold War thinkers is, is that the games drove the doctrine to such a degree. I think that's an interesting, that's the essence of the critique here. So just to summarize some of those things, you have this idea that perfect information, right? You're communicating very clearly with each other. I have told you the rules. In reality, you're not necessarily communicating clearly. You have multiple channels of communication which might reinforce or conflict or be more or less open at any one time with one or more adversaries. And you might not believe them. You might not believe them. Your information may be right or wrong, and it may uh, take the INF issue, intermediate nuclear forces issue, right? So the US and NATO firmly believes that the Russians have violated the INF treaty. Uh, that information may or may not be right. I'm not here to talk about that today. The Russians are saying, well, it's not right, but if we, you know, we have these other systems, et cetera, et cetera, and we're going to act in this particular way. And so you're then in a position where your formal discourse is different to your, your informal, your, your intelligence discourse, if you like. And so then you have to make a decision, which do you believe? And so that's imperfect information. Mutual understanding of payoffs, your scoring system point. I mean, there, is, there wasn't really one. There was you get to keep playing, but we could have had one. Uh, uh, but you both knew what that was. You both knew what the rules are, but you don't necessarily know what the other person's value structure is or the other decision maker's value structure is. So how do you know how to threaten it effectively? Uh, Off-board moves we talked about. Rational actors. Um, yeah, there was a number of comments about people saying, you know, why would you behave in a particular way because clearly it's going to end in catastrophe. And yet in our first game, two out of five did. Um, so there you go. Not everybody's... People behave with bounded rationality, but the trick is working out what are those bounds. You know, what are the value structures that, that people are adhering to? And communication we've talked about already. So, so that whole set of models is problematic in a number of ways, which leads you to think about reactions to it. Uh, and this is a DSDL model, which uh, Ollie Barton from DSDL presented at our conference a couple of years ago. And so the general idea behind it, as Ollie expressed, was that you need to be able to understand some of those three questions. What, what it is you want to do, what is it you want them to do and to, to not do? What are you, as the deterrer, willing and able to do about it if they do not? And why is it in their interest to comply? So this is an interesting one, isn't it? It's about manipulating the payoff for the adversary, about potentially even showing a positive outcome uh, that, that might line up with actions that you want them to take. So it's kind of, if not win-win, at least you know, not as bad of a lose. Um, how might they achieve their objectives differently? 
and why will their current course of action fail to achieve them, which does kind of interact with these other things. So there's this idea of showing the other side, and telling the other side, and persuading, and maybe even working together with the other side in a way that could convince them about certain things, any kind of communication that will answer those questions. And the point is that in a crisis and in steady state, those ideas might be, those communications strategies might be different. You know, I mean, maybe tweeting about, I'm going to, I don't know, today we elevate our force readiness in Europe because of ethnic, Rus you know, a Russian uprising in Nava or something. You know, the kind of kick, traditional kicking off NATO, Russia. I don't, know, I don't know about you, but if you look at enough uh, sort of NATO-Russia war games, you sort of start to think, I think I've seen all these, I think these scenarios are all, I've seen them all before. But anyway, um, we have this, uh, this idea that in a crisis, steady state communications are different. Obviously, steady state is slower. There's other channels available to you. Diplomacy is more likely to be possible. In a crisis, things are going to move quickly and be more confusing. But one of the things I find quite interesting about this, and this isn't Ollie's point, this is mine, um, is that this idea of passive deterrence, that you might be able to deter purely through possession, uh, which might be one framing that you could put on what the UK does. This idea that you have a nuclear weapon capability, you don't talk that much about what and how you would use it, um, that if you're not communicating those things, this communications model to some extent, reconciling those two things to me is quite an interesting challenge. I think the answer comes with you know, the point I made earlier about how conventional and, and nuclear interact, about how nuclear deterrence is special but not separate in a way. And so if you're thinking about this communications model, you have to think about all the things you're doing, not just nukes. You have to think about economics. You have to think about diplomacy. You have to think about people to people contacts. You have to think about conventional military. I think that more unified picture is probably the way to reconcile it. But honestly, I think. Uh, there's a lot more work and research to be done in that case. But in, this is, I think, quite an interesting idea, and it gets towards a slightly more squishy nature of the conversations that you all were having when you played those two games. Oh, there we go. Right. Another concept, extended deterrence. So now this is, that's sort of the, the trajectory of history. There's, the extended version of this <laughs> goes into some Russian models as well, which I think are interesting. But um, we're going to sort of go laterally here no pun intended, to look at extended deterrence. So the idea that extended deterrence is framed now typically as something like, you know, US nuclear umbrella. You must have heard that phrase, right? Nuclear umbrella. This idea that um, European allies will be protected by US nuclear weapons. That wasn't the original meaning of it. It wasn't extending it geographically. It was extending it, you know, in terms of intensity. It was about how to deter something less than all-out war. Yes, it was considered partly in an alliance context, but it was, more, it was considered more in sort of limited terms, right? How would you make it plain to an adversary who had only limited gains and that you knew that or you thought that very strongly and you thought, more importantly, they thought that you thought they weren't, you know, going for an all-out attack, etc. How would you deter them just making small gains around the edges, nibbling here and there? Uh, who's seen, who, who's watched any Yes Prime Minister? Gosh, I'm, I'm being age gapped because that number, you know, five years ago would have been a lot higher. Go to YouTube and find the episode of Yes Prime Minister about the Chief Scientific Advisor. And the Chief Scientific Advisor is advising the Prime Minister on nuclear deterrence at this point. It's a very interesting uh, explanation of the challenges of extended deterrence, although it's not framed that way and it's actually very funny. Um, but the, the answer goes something like this. We have divided East and West Germany. There is a fire on the western side of Berlin, uh, and East German firefighters cross the border to support. Do you press the button? Yes, no, well, clearly no. Right. OK, they're there for a while now. Then they're supported by East German police. Do you press the button? Probably not. Now they're supported by some Russian military who are helping to put out the fires and you know, generally clear debris and all that sort of stuff. Do you push the button? Well, it started to get a bit nasty, but I challenge any of you to sort of say, yes, I would push the button at that point. And it goes on. And it goes on. And so the point is, how are you going to deter, if, if you even thought that that was preconceived, how do you deter that action with the ultimate weapon, which has this quite limited political utility that Brody outlines? With great difficulty, I think, is the answer. Uh, maybe it goes back to that point about unifying conventional and nuclear deterrence. So I, we're not here to talk about modern deterrence today, but I suspect that's where this goes. But honestly, that was where this idea of extended deterrence comes from. It's not, how does the US credibly deter Russian attack on West Germany? 
It's about how does the US or anybody deter uh, a limited war with limited objectives that is explicitly not about the triumph of one model of governance over another that is not going to be all out because of all these issues that we've had before about when you sort of go over the nuclear threshold, you just don't know where it's going to end up. Right? You can try and control escalation, but you might not succeed. Um, anyway, so we have this kind of idea. So the key concepts that fall within that, we're not going to talk about them in tremendous detail because they just go on and on and on. But these are some of the key concepts that are worth thinking about. One is conventional deterrence, as I said, right? So if you have strengthened conventional military capabilities, to go back to the example of the chief scientific advisor and the fire in, in West Berlin, right? If you have, for example, a very strong West German police force at that point, what's the, you know, they're immediately going to be outnumbering East German border police. They're immediately going to be outnumbering Russian soldiers even. There is less of a case that facts on the grounds would be created quickly. There is less of a case that the crisis would escalate inevitably to that point, and so on and so on. So you have this sort of idea that resilience and conventional capabilities can contribute to it. Limited nuclear war. Okay, so your question about um, dual-capable aircraft earlier. Here we go. So there's this idea that there might be, yes, the use of nuclear weapon anywhere might be strategic, but also it's, evident, it, there's, it's on evidence of having been considered by both sides during the Cold War. You can see declassified exercise records. Very interesting, uh, sort of pick, unpicking how they would have used nuclear weapons, not quite tactically, um, but using a limited number of nuclear weapons for explicitly limited objectives and attempting to communicate that to an adversary by actions, words, actions, words, and by images. Um, and so on, by trying to retain secure second strike as well as having flexible options. You may quail from that idea, but it was, uh, it was well, and is to some extent, where, um, where those capabilities go. The diplomacy of violence, which I believe is a shelling phrase. Jamie, diplomacy of violence, shelling, I think. Oh, good, excellent. <laughs> Thank you for backing me up. Um, I think it is, anyway. I had a moment of doubt. Uh, which is why I should never be doing any deterrence um, communications, that moment of doubt. Anyway, um, this idea that you're using your nuclear forces for no real purpose militarily, but you're using it to enhance bargaining, bargaining power. Uh, but, of course, if you use all your nuclear weapons to deter, to in, you know, I've said that I will use my nuclear weapons if you do X, you have done X, therefore I can use my nuclear weapons. What's happened to my bargaining power? Well, it's gone, because it was in the, it was in the threat. It wasn't in the use. Uh, so now we're in a different game. It's not to say, anyway. And then you have these other two ideas that... It's decoupling a phrase that people have heard recently. It has been going around quite a bit. Some nodding. Where have you heard it? East Asia, probably. South Korea and so forth. No, you were nodding gently. Where have you come across that phrase before? Yeah, okay, fine. Okay. All right, so there's this idea that uh, in a circumstance where allies have committed to defend each other, that uh, it might be possible through other means to... To, to separate their interests, to make it less plausible that the protector would come to the aid of the protectee. Right, there's a number of ways that could be done. So the protectee might therefore pursue means to ensure that that protection would come. Yes, they trust their ally, but they want to be really, really sure that they don't have to rely on that trust. So they might, I mean, the Israeli nuclear deterrent is the classic example of this, right? That um, yes, it's about sort of deterring, you know, attack, chemical weapons use, all that sort of stuff. But it's also about saying to others who might come and protect it, the US, for example, you know, this will be a nuclear conflict. This will be a nuclear conflict, and your interests will be engaged in that. There will be a nuclear conflict in the Gulf if we are attacked to this extent. Or, or more to the point, you can't guarantee that there won't be. Um, and so the idea is, that, or at least the analysis goes, it catalyzes intervention. Other states without nuclear capabilities may also try to do that through other means. They might, they might exhibit to their allies the potential to escalate a conflict by potentially crossing a shared adversary's threshold in a number of ways, by potentially reaching onto its soil, which then might cause it to escalate, and so on. So there's this idea that it's a very strange kind of idea to get your head around, but it's basically sort of saying that none of us can know where this ends, but my security is only guaranteed when you come to my aid. So I want to remove the question of doubt from your mind. This is always going to be a conflict where you will want to come to my aid. That's basically this, this idea. Um, Co-option within an alliance, really. Almost coercion. It's quite an interesting idea. But challenges. 
How believable is it? Brodie and Schelling, again, both cited by... Oh, there we go. There's the reference to the Delpesh paper. Um, so, Brodie, if we hit... We'll hit back if we hit directly ourselves, but will we do so if any of our chief allies is attacked? Right? We may be committed to respond to that, but at surely we would weigh up the security of our own people when so doing. So aren't we just back in the usual deterrence game again? That's the critique from Brody. From Schelling, again, similar idea. If the Russians attack us, well, clearly we'll fight back. We don't need to tell them that. But how do we convince them that we'll fight back if they attack other people? That's a bit harder, especially as we've told them, as part of our means of ensuring stability between us, as you did in your games, we want peace. We will not use our weapons. And yet, and yet it requires us to demonstrate to an adversary um, that we would also use them in a discretionary way, that when we don't have to use them, we would, you know, how do we indicate that that is a necessity, that that is an in, a point of survival? Really difficult question to answer. So those are the two real big challenges to the idea, and a lot of um, alliance work goes into sort of maintaining those things, those questions about how believable it is. And, and then it sort of leads to this idea of co-option with alliances, you know, if you were a protectee, you might well have these thoughts yourself and think, well, I don't want to leave it up to trust or analysis or self-interest. I want to force the hand of the protector. You might well think that. So here's some examples. I've cited some of them. NATO, US Japan, USR OK. USSR Cuba, I suppose, obviously led to one of the major crises of the Cold War. Um, but one of those is, I'm not going to go into that exam question, actually. I should have taken that one off. That's from a different lecture. Although if anybody has any comments, they're very welcome to add them. I think that would be quite interesting. But um, I think that bottom point is worth bearing in mind. Extended deterrence relationships are not a, just a pure benefit to the recipient of that relationship. Uh, they also restrain in some ways. There is a price sometimes for this. Um, there might be, uh, the might, price might be formal. It might be a restriction on behavior, as in South Korea. Uh, yes, it's not expressed through the alliance, but South Korea, for example, has restrictions on uh, enrichment and reprocessing uh, as part of its US uh, nuclear cooperation agreement, which it's trying to lift. It had until relatively recently fairly stringent restrictions on what ballistic missile technology the US would countenance it developing. Those are not removed entirely, but they have been limited. So, uh, or they've been lifted, I should say. So, you know, these things come at a price which might be formal like that. It might be informal in a sense of um, creating a political dynamic in the protecting country that says something like this. If the US is on our side, if NATO is with us, what, what do we need to do? Why do we need to spend all of our money? This 2% of GDP problem. Why do we need to spend all of our money on XYZ capabilities? Aren't we better off diverting it somewhere else because our security comes from alliances, et cetera, et cetera? Um, and so that can be negative in a way. You know, it might weaken conventional deterrence, or it can be positive. It can restrain allies from the perspective of Washington or the protector from developing those catalyzing capabilities. You might be quite interested in retaining your discretion. You might want your adversary, and this is the restriction on South Korea right here. Yeah? You might be interested in retraining, retaining your discretion. You might want to remove any possibility that your protectee would drag you into a situation that you were not completely happy with, that you would not be able to extricate yourself from one if you didn't completely trust them. So those are quite interesting. And I suppose, you know, USSR Cuba might be an example where um, Castro was viewed in that way. Anyway, there we go. This is the last slide I have. Um, but I think it's quite a tricky one. So this is about deterrence in international law, or rather nuclear deterrence in international law. I should have written nuclear there, shouldn't I? There was an International Court of Justice advisory opinion on this issue in 1996. Has anybody come across this issue at all before? Anybody thought about it much? Good. <laughs> As a diplomat, so I hope so. Um, yeah. So this was an advisory non-binding opinion, um, and the court was split on it. I think it was actually entirely even, and the chairperson gave, a, gave an opinion. Um, so these are the headlines, and it's a long judgment, and if you're at all interested, it's worth a look, because to some extent, this is a... This, this judgment itself isn't at the root of contemporary dynamics around disarmament and so forth that you're here today, but it is a manifestation of the ideas that underpin it still. So there's this idea that 
deterrence is a threat to use weapons under certain circumstances. So that is, yet, that is a third characterization. It's, the deter it's entirely saying it's deterrence by punishment, a threat to use weapons under certain circumstances, which is not necessarily a, uh, an, kind of an intellectual construct that everybody would get on board with, but that is, that is how it's practiced. Um, so they find that the threat's not necessarily illegal, not necessarily illegal. If three conditions are met, one, it should be retaliatory, so you shouldn't go first. Two, it should be necessary in some way. And they go on to define necessary. And there are sort of various definitions of necessary and proportionate. And then thirdly, proportionate in international law. And it relies on all these other examples, this sort of thing. Um, so the proportionate point of it is sort of saying, well, you know, it's weighing it against anticipate direct military advantage uh, that an adversary might accrue by conducting the action that you prevent them from accruing. So it's, it's actually quite, it's a utilitarian framing. If anybody's come across that idea, it's sort of saying, what I'm going to do is I'm going to average the benefit to all people in the world, and I'm going to try and make that number as big as possible. I'm going to try and maximize benefit over some population, um, which is quite economic in a way. Um, it sort of leaves out the kind of um, morality of conscious point. That comes in later. Um, which I think is a kind of almost a cognitive dissonance in, in the judgment. But anyway, there's this idea that it shouldn't be excessive. Uh, and then it must be necessary. It must help to militarily defeat an enemy and be an attack on a military objective. So it's kind of saying that counter value, you, you know, by this definition is starting to look a little bit sketchy, I think. If you were to accept this judgment, and I'm not saying that you should or that I do, but just reading the judgment, um, that, that's kind of an interesting one, isn't it? And then that bolded one is just, you know, quote out. So they're basically saying that in almost all circumstances, threat or, threat or use would be contrary to the rules of international law in this non-binding opinion. Uh, but they can't conclude definitively whether it would be use or threat of nuclear weapons would be lawful or unlawful in extreme circumstances of self-defense, blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's sort of that UN charter thing where you're kind of reserving the right to defense of the state, uh, all that sort of stuff. Um, so non-binding, and uh, if you look at the nationalities of the judges, you know, it's, well, it's politics as much as it's law. You know, they vote on country lines. Um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. Now, who's come across that idea? Otherwise known as the Ban Treaty. Nods, 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 okay, more. Okay, does anybody know much about it? Well, you're gonna know a lot more later on, because Christina's gonna <laughs> lecture on it. So I'm not going to go into the details here, but, it springs to some extent, in my view, there's a thread that runs through from this judgment through to the Ban Treaty. You can extend it before that, but there's some other things as well, which Christina will go into. Um, but there's this idea that human security is supreme. That's where this is coming from, is that this issue of proportionality, necessitary, and attacks on military objectives, that speaks very closely to this idea of, um, of human security versus state security. And interestingly enough, although this sort of utilitarian, this proportionate idea is kind of utilitarian, you, you could say, uh, this is, that, um, is that this human security idea is, is not really a utilitarian one. It's, it's more individual. And I find that that's an evolution in the narrative over time, which I'm sure Christina will, will talk about a little bit. Right. Um, so anyway, you'll come to that a little bit later on. But the whole idea behind the treaty is effectively to say that to move on from this idea that the threat or use of nuclear weapons is generally contrary, but we can't rule it out, blah, blah, blah. And it's just saying, no, uh, they are uh, illegal full stop. Now, it's obviously only binding on the states that sign it. That's one thing. And it's not entered into force yet, but it will. So you'll hear more about that later.